Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. It's all a hustle. Don't you see it's all a hustle? Keep playing it, Robert. The next phrase is for Obama. He smiles like a reptile. She loves him. She loves him. <laughs> Gene Genie lives on his back. Everyone sing along. Follow the bouncing America. Follow the bouncing presidency. All right, so here we are. It's all a hustle. Many of you believe that the Democrats are pure evil, the Republicans are as clean as the driven snow, or vice versa. Many of you believe that the Republicans are pure evil, and the Democrats are clean as the driven snow. I have a rather different opinion. I say it's all a hustle. It's all a shuck and a jive. The whole thing is a game and a scam. And it has been from the get-go. And I'm going to tell you why I say it has been from the get-go. Many of you glorify the founding fathers. Like there's some gl glorious, noble, great men better than the rest of us. And America was a perfect place when the founding fathers ran America. Well, I have a little bad news for you. It's all a hustle. John Boehner is no different than Alexander Hamilton, one of our revered founding fathers. You see, John Boehner or McConnell or the other sellout Republicans in doing deals against the will of the people and the best interests of the people in selling us out to the New World Order globalism, if you want to put it that way, is actually holding up Obama's deal with the New World Order, the Bilderbergers, if you want to put it that way. But it's no different than what happened during the Whiskey Rebellion way back in 1794. You see, shortly after the American Revolution, when the people of America didn't want to pay taxes to the British, amongst other things, what happened was the new government of America wanted the taxes. The new government of the founding fathers said, no, no, we want the taxes ourselves now. So the resistors to these taxes on distillery products, mainly in the West, said, no, we're not paying the tax. So what happened was Alexander Hamil Hamilton put together a military response to the rebellion against paying taxes to the new federal government. And the great George Washington, one of our great, great, bigger-than-life heroes, mounted his horse on September 30th and led a force of 13,000 soldiers, larger than any American army amassed in one place during the entire revolution, to put down the rebellion among citizens. This was the first and only time a sitting American president ever led troops into battle. Did you know that? So he left that shortly thereafter to Alexander Hamilton, another one of the revered founding fathers, to scare off the American citizens who didn't want to pay taxes on whiskey that they made themselves. And that's why I say it's all a hustle. It's all a hustle, and what Obama is doing is no different than what They've done for the beginning of time in many ways, except he's a fanatic on social issues. That's the difference. But on taxation and on trade, tell me how Boehner is any different uh, than Alexander Hamilton. They're pushing a new secret White House deal with China. They won't let anyone read it. It's still hidden in the Capitol basement. And right now, Obama has a rebellion on his hands, not from the Republicans who we put in power, but who from? But from the unions. And the progressives, they don't want Obama trade. They don't want this secret deal with China. But who's pushing it? John the Drunk Boehner. The gobbler, McConnell. So what's that about? It's about taxation without representation. It's about selling out the citizens to some greater power. And that's why I'm playing today weird songs such as Gene Genie by David Bowie, which I'd like to play again. And I'm not going to ask you to call because many of you are lost already since I can't have you... Listen to me and say Republicans good, Democrats bad, or we're, our side is against them Dems. Right away, I'll get the knee-jerk uh, listeners to talk radio to call in. Yeah, Mike, them Dems are really bad, and if only we get them good Republicans in like the founding fathers, why we could save the nation. I'm a little more cynical than that. And that's why when I entered radio 21 years ago, I said, hey, don't confuse me with a Republican. I know there are many copycats right now, uh, carbon copies we used to call them. But I've been the original 
the original independent in talk radio, and I have been and I continue to be. So what good does that do you? Nothing. I'm only here to entertain you. Since I have no entertainment, uh, no power of persuasion whatsoever, we're going to play music today and talk about the news. So let's begin again with one of my favorite new songs, which I can't get out of my head. I like the next line. Sits like a man, but smiles like a reptile. That kind of goes for all of them, doesn't it? I don't know what David Bowie was on, man, but where did they get these lyrics from? You got to you gotta hand it to these stoned entertainers. They go into another world that, that us rationalists can never even understand. All we can do is enjoy the product of their, of their time travel. That's why I love art, music, poetry. He lives on his back. What would the world be like without the crazy people? What a boring world it would be, my God. A world of politicians and sports talkers? I spent about 40 minutes before the show today. I was like trying to pick music for the show. I was saying, why am I doing music? Why am I spending all this time searching for songs? Because music elevates me. Music lifts me up. Music carries me. So I couldn't get this Gene Genie out of my head. I couldn't get I Feel Love by Donna Summer out of my head. I couldn't get How Can You Mend the Broken Heart by the Bee Gees out of my head. I couldn't get A Horse With No Name by American out of my head. And I said to myself, I'm going to incorporate some of this music today and try to tell the story of the real America, the actual America, as opposed to the Fantasia, the Walt Disney Fantasia America that is in the minds of most Americans that somehow there was a better place sometime in the past. Now, I admit Obama is a special category of deceiver and liar. I admit that. I've written books about it, and I've documented the deceit and the lies. There's no question about it. He has taken us to a new low level. And it leads you to ask, what kind of sane nation would be obsessed about a transgendered penis? And then you ask yourself, what do Bruce Jenner's penis, Howard Stern's wig, and Barack Obama's patriotism have, have in common? Well, I'll let you figure the answer to that out. I mean, a penis, a wig, and a patriot? I don't really know. But what do Bruce Jenner's penis, Howard Stern's wig, and Barack Obama's patriotism have in common? Well, I think what we've got to do now is play, let's say... A horse with no name. Everyone take a shroom and sing along. Be an average co-ed at NYU. On my uh, Skype screen, they're in Dallas. I'm here in the San Francisco area. I'm dancing, I'm singing, the dog is asleep at my feet. And I'm asking myself, where is this going to end? We're all going, you know we're in a handbasket, don't you? Now yesterday I hit a new high or a new low, depending upon your orientation when I talked about expunging the Bible and the Quran of all of the hate and the, uh, well, you know, you would say fire and brimstone. I would say take out all of those that say thou shalt kill a homosexual, thou shalt kill an adulterer. And I set off a shockwave across the thinking land of America. I recognize that many people heard the show and many people uh, were shocked by what I said because they said, wait, what are you calling for censorship of the Bible? I said, I didn't call for censorship of the Bible. I called for some re reality of the Bible because we cannot have millions or hundreds of millions of sub-morons who are illiterate in any language reading rubbish like this and then going out and cutting people's throats and blowing up buildings because they think some uh, holy book told them to cut the throats of people or blow up buildings. And the only way this is going to happen is through a reformation of Islam. And uh, that has to happen. It's that simple. I'm not the first one to call for it. Some of the most advanced minds in Islam have called for it, mainly women, not the men. The men don't have the nerve that the women do, and only the women can save us. So on that lovely note on the Savage Nation, we next go to my next little song, which is Donna Summer, I Feel Love, only the uh, instrumental part, please. We'll go to break and take your calls at 855-407-282. I Feel Love by Donna Summer, going out to all the transgender in America. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282, SAVAGE. Welcome back. Experimental radio. I decided to do experimental radio as often as I can right now. In the last days of freedom in America and the world, I figured, you know what? I may as well have fun. I've been trying to do it for 21 years, and sometimes I've achieved it. But you know what? Now I'm going to really have fun. I'm going to just let it all hang out. It's all a hustle. John Bain and no different than Alexander Hamilton, one of our revered founding fathers. Uh, you know, we say John Bain is a sellout doing a deal against the best interests of the people. Really? 
That's a shocker. Well, so uh, explain to me why George Washington and Alexander Hamilton led a, an army of 13,000 troops against the citizens who wanted to uh, make their own moonshine back in the 1700s, by the way, and not pay a tax on it. But things have really changed, huh? The ruled and the rulers. Yeah, we've had an illusion that we have power. And maybe there's been times you had a little more power or freedom than we have now, but yeah, maybe Obama's a new, a new breed of, let's say, dictatorial maniac with his social policies, and sure, all of that. But, you know, in the big picture, writ large, basically, we're the ruled. And whether you like it or not, they're the rulers. I know, yeah, I understand the government, other people, by the people, for the, yeah, 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 sure. Tell me when that existed. In your grandfather's time, everyone was a patriot, I get it. It was a rock rib, clean America. It's all new now. It's heroes falling apart. It's all a hustle. I'm a cynic. That's the end of the story. And that's all. And the best I can do here is try to tell you the truth on whatever the topic may be. The global warming lie, another shuck and jive in order to steal money from us. Climate science is a complete fraud. Complete fraud. We all know that. We've been through a cooling phase. Now they're trying to rig up the, the data now. Noah. Because there's so much money at stake. So I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to give out Mecca. Countdown scholarship applicants from young Americans who actually love the country. They have fantasy and they live in the fantasy of a pure America that it can, it can exist again. Meanwhile, the world is changing so fast, almost no one can keep up with it. Whether it be Uber taking over the taxi business, do I have to, you know, spell it out for you? Do I have to spell out for you what's going on? The change of everything in America from uh, gender identity. We're, now we're talking about some freak's penis. How does a 65-year-old Jewish man like Howard Stern get away with wearing a disgusting wig? How? The same way Bar Barack Obama can say that he's not a divider. Does it without, yeah, without even, with no shame. How? Obama comes out the way Stern comes out. He ridicules cripples. He ridicules people who are who are uh, uh, handicapped, and people think it's humor. It's unbelievable to me what people get away with. Hey, different strokes for different folks. If you find that entertaining, you're a sick piece of garbage. That's all. I'm going to go to unscreened calls. That's all I'm going to do. I don't know where you're from. I don't know your name. If I don't like you, I'll hang up on you immediately. Line number seven. You're on the Savage Nation from WABC. What's on your mind? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. What's on your mind? All right, so here's my question. I think it started in the 80s with the smoking and the seatbelt and the thing of people interacting. You know, if someone spoke, you go, excuse me, could you please put it together? With people interacting, with people talking, and suddenly switched, slowly, suddenly became, we're all going to use the police to help us out. We're going to create a, a higher force. So what, you're saying America's, the, the what, the uh, restriction of our freedoms began with with anti-smoking uh, laws or seat belts? When did it begin? Exactly. Subtle, tiny things that seem to be, like, safe for us. Well, I agree with you. I thought about that many times. I said, how did the gays and lesbians get us in such a lock grip where we accept whatever they do to us now as just another incremental destruction of our civilization? I said, well, okay, it started with the seat belt. I mean, we, I grew up in a time where there were no seat belts. Then there were seat belts, but they were sort of optional because you had them around your lap and the cops couldn't see if they were on you. Then the government figured out a shoulder strap where the cops could see that they were on you. So everyone automatically now puts a seatbelt on. Automatically now everybody checks themselves, no matter what the pervert says to them. No matter what the sick sisters in the colleges do to their children, uh, they say, well, I'm not going to say anything because I have to wear the seatbelt around my mouth. Is, is that what you're talking about? <laughs> you're nailing on that. You're right on the nail. Well, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're listening to why I'm in a paralogical state of mind today and why you're not going to get the same old, same old about the founding fathers from me. Because I'm sick and tired of this glorification and idealization of an America that never existed. You're getting a free copy of Countdown to Mecca. All I can do is create and experiment on radio. I hope you'll stay with me. I'll be back in a few minutes right here in the Savage Nation with something brand new, I guarantee you. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. What makes the I mean, if you're, okay, listen to me. You know, you're all complaining how bad you have and how horrible life is, and we know that the reptile in the White House is as bad as they can get, I think. 
We know that. We understand that we have no party. We have a one-party system. I mean, you ask yourself, where are those young conservatives that were elected? Senator Cotton, they stripped them of all committee assignments, denied all funding to his congressional district. In other words, they put him, he's the Rosa Parks of the Republican Party. And where is that young black lady elected in the last election, whose name you have forgotten, super conservative, Salt Lake City, black woman in a white district, where, where is she? She's the Rosa Parks of the Republican Party. The vermin called John Boehner and McConnell, these racist pigs, put her in the back of the bus, and they get away with it. Why? Not because of the race or the sex or this. Uh, it's because of the politics. The conservative is the new black in America. The conservative is the new whipping boy in America. So what happened to the country? I don't know. So how do you live with it? You can complain about a day and night. You could sit and fetch and read the news stories about what they're doing and sit here and talk about a better time in the past and how we got to do this and got to do that. All right, there's an audience for that. But you know what? Don't count me. Uh, count me out of that one. I, I've done it for 20 years. Let me tell you something. The world is changing around all of us. The landscape of politics is changing right in front of our eyes. It's as though a great smoke is coming off a swamp. And we don't even know what's going to be left when the smoke clears. It's as though we're waking up every day to a new dawn. And in this new dawn, there's a huge fog on a swamp. And we don't know what the swamp contains. We don't know what kind of animals are in that swamp. We don't know what's going to come at us next. That's how most people see the world. And I'm talking about people who are conscious. I'm not talking about the average schmendrick around you. The guy walking down the street next to you doesn't know what's going on around them. He doesn't know, nor does he care. When did he ever know or care? Tell me when the average Joe ever cared or knew what was going on around him. Never. Not until he walked into a plate glass window or got hit by a bus in a crosswalk did he know what was going on. But it's worse now. You got the schmucks running around with, with a phone in their hand, and they look at it. They cross a street looking into an iPhone. That's the world you live in. So the world's changing. Everything's changed. Radio's changing. Talk radio is not what it was, never mind 20 years ago, never mind 10 years ago, never mind five years ago. Talk radio is not what it was one minute ago. And so you have to be flexible. You have to be able to create. You have to be able to move on a dime, not only for your own survival, but for the survival of the whole medium of talk radio. I'm taking a gamble. I'm experimenting. Yesterday, I did the Bible. I don't want to do it right now. And if you want to call on it, I'll handle it. Today, I'm doing something else. I'm doing music, poetry, science, art. I have a few ideas about where I'm going to go today, but I'm not 100% sure I'm going to let you take us there because I feel that the American people themselves who actually are tuned into talk radio, who still listen to talk radio, who care enough to pick up a, a cell phone and call a show, they will direct the future course of this country. And that's why I called it Unprotected Talk when I started this format a few years ago. Now, I went away from unprotected talk for a while, and I went into screen calls because I was getting such awful calls that I couldn't handle it. But now I'm going to go back to unprotected talk to see what's inside the swamp as the fog lifts. Let's begin on line number two, 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 two. Line two, MAL, Washington, D.C., what's on your mind, line two? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Savage, uh, I hear that and the rumor that uh, Obama... Uh being satirical, wants to change dog food to make it more what Michelle Obama wants. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, oh, you mean that it's not healthy enough for our animals? She needs a more a healthier dog food. Oh, uh, right. It, we have to slim down. Yeah, well, the pets need to. I wonder what Bo eats. Bo, the White House dog. I wonder if he gets a special slim down uh, dog chow. I kind of doubt it. I would suspect he dines on, on, on steak and... Uh, and Chardonnay, but anyway, what else is on your mind? And, and on the China, don't forget the fine China. Mm -hmm. The who China? What who? The the the, the uh, White House uh, uh, porcelain China they eat on. Oh oh well, what do you want to eat on paper plates? It's not a picnic. It's the White House. By the way, you have awesome callers, and you seem even more focused, Doctor Savage. Since you mean even though I'm sounding unfocused, I'm more focused. No, you were yeah. focused. Now you're. You're yeah, I am. I, I mean, I'm, so, I'm following the Cassius Clay lead. You knew him as Muhammad Ali. Uh, I still call him Cassius Clay, where he said, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. bee. Uh, you, get what I'm, you get what I'm saying? The, the neurotoxins in, in the, uh, the verbal onslaught every day are enough to paralyze or anesthetize anybody. All right, I'm sending you a free copy of a book called Countdown to Mecca. You know that there are still people who read books. Would you believe that? 
In your lifetime, the bookstore will disappear, as sure as I'm sitting here. There'll be no bookstore. I don't know what it's going to be, like a barn with, with uh, pet products in it or something. But I grew up writing books. I can't help it. I can't stop myself. To me, the book is still some kind of sacred thing. It's in my genetics. It's in my blood. It's in my people. It's in my genes going all the way back to uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Moses. The book is still king to me. And so that's why I continue to write them. To me, the written word is something significant and something that will kind of always last. And uh, that's why I continue to do books. I'm not going to change. Nevertheless, let's see what the listeners have to say. Line number five. I have to go slowly because they don't know. See, if I don't say their number, they won't know they're going to be picked. And then there's a blank spot. So I have to sound like I'm talking to... uh, Uh, a Democrat voter. Line number five. You're on the Savage Nation. Go ahead, please. Hey, Mike. I, I, uh, you know, I'm commenting on your, uh, your comment about, uh, you have to free yourself. And I, I don't see how that's happened, how that can be done. It's always, uh, we're always having interference ran upon us. Um, example, war on women. Now, I'm 55 years old, and I've always felt there was a war on men, you can't have... No, there's no war on women. That's, a, that's rubbish put out by the feminist Nazis, and we know that. What war on women? The only war on women is being conducted by ISIS. They don't say a word about it. I would say raping an eight-year-old girl that you kidnap and capture is a war on women. And I'd like to see one of those big, fat mouth ugly things, those creatures in the, in the women's movement, say one word about kidnap and rape in the Middle East. Don't give me this crap about war on women in America. There is no war on women. Absolutely. All right, so there's one from the heart and one from the gut. What more can I say? The day a feminist talks about the rape of young women in Nigeria by the Muslims in Hoko Barama, whatever pocus hocus they are, or the rape of young girls by Muslims in Iraq and Syria. They don't know this. Someone who's serious about the war on women. I've just gotten over a sore throat. I shouldn't yell. I should not raise my voice. But I felt obligated to because there's nothing more serious than raping a woman. It's the worst crime you can commit on the planet. It's being done on a daily basis by the members of uh, ISIS, ISIL. We give them such nice acronyms. They're vermin. They're subhumans. They should be snuffed off the planet. Obama has our Air Force heroes flying for hours and days around them and and they don't fire a shot. Why not? Because they're on our side. We created them. We funded them. We gave them our equipment. That's why they can march with a one-mile parade of their weaponry when they took over Ramadi and we didn't fire a rocket. They're working with us. That's one analysis that might be correct, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, let me go to the next step because it's bugging me now. How could ISIS make such gains when we have America and Israel, the most powerful militaries on the earth? uh, Israel's in the area. What has Israel done to stop ISIS? Answer, nothing. So you have to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Whoa, so what do the Israelis have to do with ISIS? You want me to go into a conspiracy theory that might be real? America and Israel are on the same page of letting ISIS rage. Why? Because they want ISIS to do their bidding in taking over Syria. They want ISIS to overthrow Assad. Do you understand that one? I I don't know if people can follow this. Maybe I'm being too logical now after floating around with music by David Bowie to jump to that. Maybe too much of a of a jump cut for the movie called the, uh, the Savage Nation. So let's go to the next caller out of the air. Pluck it out of the air, Mike. Mike, pluck it out of the air. Line three. Go ahead. You're on the Savage Nation from MAL in Washington. What's on your mind, sir? Yes, Michael. I can't tell you how much you made my night when you talked about expunging the Bible of uh, the injunctions to kill for this sin or that sin. Because before you said all that, I already had rejoiced in thinking that we had reached the nadir of our culture with Bruce DeGenerate. I said, you yes. can't go any yes. lower than that. Well, right. Howard Stern's wig and Bruce Jenner's penis are in the same category as Obama's patriotism. But I'm one of the members, I'm a member of the largest group you have in the religious Jewish community, Chabad. And so I look at things a little differently. You are a Chabad member, and you didn't take umbrage with my suggestion that the calls for homicide should be expunged from the Old Testament? No, I doubly rejoiced, because I realized that... Wow. Uh, No, I I, I can't believe... I figured I lost my entire religious Jewish audience yesterday. Well, you see, you don't have the mentality that we have in the Chabad community. The mentality that we have is when you say 
borders, language, and culture. We know that we came out of Egypt. Egypt was the lowest level of humanity that ever existed. And we had something that were called Metzorin. Metzorin means borders. Oh, now, well, hold on. Now I'm going to get a lecture on something. I'm, am I getting a slight migraine? Where are we going with this? With this, that since you were talking about expunging the Bible, the holiest book that ever was, the book that we never wrote, that no man ever wrote, but because of your anthropology background and you subscribe to cultural relativism, you think that it must be something that man made up. It can't be anything greater than that. Right, so you're taking umbrage with my suggestion that the calls for homicide be written. You're actually taking the opposite view. Right, and you know why? Because we Because you're a fanatic. I understand why, because you're a, you're a robot and a fanatic. No, because there's a prophecy that says that the, the Messiah will not come until the whole world turns to heresy. So here you have Michael Savage. All right, here we go. Now, the whole world's turning to heresy because I said take murder out of the Bible. Great. Because That's <laughs> not, Yeah, well, why don't you hang me now? I'm a heretic. Hang me now because I said stop killing the homosexuals because they're getting it from the, from the Quran. So I'm the bad guy or they're the bad guy? You don't play the game. You can't make up the rules. Now, let me tell you about the Bible. Oh, I can't make up the rules. So you want me to go out and kill gays? Is that what you're saying? We would do that. The Jewish people didn't have any reformation, uh, contrary to what you said. The Jewish people only had been expelled. Now, wait a minute. Then why don't Orthodox Jews go out and kill adulterers? The whole Jew Holy Land wouldn't tolerate... No, I, I, you have to answer the questions. You're telling me you want the Bible interpreted literally. Isn't that what you're saying? Because God wrote it? to be interpreted literally. I'm asking you to answer a question. Stop hocking me at Shinnick like I'm some 13-year-old in, in a synagogue that you can beat up with a foul breath and garlic stuck falling out of your pocket with sponge cake falling out of your beard. Stop it already. Answer my question. Do you want to go out and kill adulterers because your God wrote it? Because, because God is our creator and we have to answer to him. You don't because you're a free thinker. I just asked you a question. So then you're saying Chabadnik should kill adulterers? I'm saying all Jews, because God commanded it, and the eternal covenant should do what God commands, don't you? So you say then that you want to go out and kill adulterers. Is that what you're arguing? Other things being equal, we would do it. We haven't been reformed. The, the Muslims... Wait, I don't understand. What do you mean things being equal? So you mean the fanatical Chabad organization would actually kill adulterers if they could? The whole Jewish organization would do it, not just Chabad, because it's an eternal co commandment from God. So, so you believe in killing gays and you believe in killing adulterers? Are you kidding me? I believe what God tells me as a commandment to do. You don't, because you're a free thinker. That's where you're going wrong. So what stops you from killing adulterers? Because we're not living in our country with other things being equal. We don't have the temple. We don't have everything around. Oh, so in other words, when the great days return, you'll start killing adulterers and gays? False. When the great days return, there won't be any uh, sin any longer. People will see the right thing to do automatically because the knowledge of God will fill the world like the water covers the seabed. So in other words, when Leviticus says a man or a woman that divineth by a ghost or a familiar spirit shall be put to death, you want to kill astrologers? They won't exist in the time of the world's transformation to the Messianic era because they'll see the right thing to do automatically. Well, that's an interesting uh, logical shift. So when the world turns to the perfect place and is transformed to a perfect place, you won't have to kill adulterers and, and astrologers. Don't be any, because we go back to the times of Adam and Eve. It's all rectified. Do you, do you as a listener of my show, although you're a religious man, so you can no longer listen to me now, right? I can listen to you because I told you I rejoiced in what you said. It means we're in, coming into the era of the final redemption. The, the Messiah won't come until the world turns to, to heresy. So you have a Jew who doesn't play the game, but he makes up the rules, and he says we can't have our holy book. That can be anything lower than that. When did I say you can't have your holy book? When you say we can take things out of it, or maybe even add things to it, we have in the book itself that says... By God, we cannot do that. So, that so you're no different than the fanatical Muslim. So the Orthodox Jew and the fanatical Muslim are one and the same. The difference between... The only difference is the Muslim has the nerve to carry it out. You don't. Live because Why don't you just convert to Islam and do what you really want to do? Why don't you join ISIS and go kill gays and uh, adulterers in, in, in Syria? You might be happier. You won't have to constrain yourself there in Brooklyn. I'll be right back.
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Crazy world, isn't it? And how do you get through a crazy world? Well, some do it through religion. They stick to the religious teachings of their father's father's father. They follow in their footsteps. They, in footsteps, they don't vary one iota. That gives them stability and sanity. And we have to respect that. The problem is when they try to impose it upon us, isn't it? That's when the trouble begins. Others say, I don't care about uh, any rules. I'm going to do it any way I can. They wind up either suicides or drug addicts or both. Because, as you well know, the human being needs structure and order. And then there's the rest of us. Some, somewhere between the religious fanatics, we have a mild belief in God and the Ten Commandments. We don't want to rely upon drugs, sex, and rock and roll to get through life. And we get through life without religious fanaticism or drugs. That's the majority of decent mankind. And Barak said unto her, if thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, I will not go. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language. Adult content, psychological nudity, listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. Welcome to The Savage Nation. Every thinking person on earth has listened to my show. Yeah, you don't know that. You never read about me. They hate me at Fox News because I leave them in the dust. I'm never mentioned by the great Rush Limbaugh for obvious reasons. God bless him. He created the medium for all of us. But he's had his day. And I got to tell you right now that what I'm attempting to do in talk radio has never been done before, which is just simply survive. I can tell you the world is changing. I can tell you you're changing. I can tell you your views are changing. I can tell you that people don't know what to do from one day to the next. And I can tell you they don't know where to turn for any guidance. They don't know where the lodestone is anymore. They don't know where north is, south is, east is, west is. So what happens in times like this is that people tend to cleave to what they know. If they're religious, they become more religious. If they're irreligious, they become more irreligious. If they're immoral, they become more immoral. If they're drug addicts, they become more addicted to drugs. If they're sex addicts, they become more addicted to sex. And so you say, well, well, then what are you talking about? Where are you leading us? I don't know. You decide where I'm leading you. I'm not leading you anywhere. I'm only a talk show host. I'm not a politician. I'm not a movie star. I have no, nothing to offer you other than thinking. I guess I'm leading you to think for yourself. Maybe that's what I'm trying to do. Maybe I'm leading you to try to think for yourself. Thinking, 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 thinking. It's as rare as writing books. Yeah, thinking today is, a, is an endangered uh, activity. So now I get attacked by a group called Right Wing Watch, and they say, Michael Savage says, in my day, Caitlyn Jenner would be in a straitjacket. They find it offensive? To me, it's commonsensical. They make it sound like I said something crazy. I'll read it to you. Michael Savage yesterday offered a very reasonable take on Caitlyn Jenner's gender transition, telling listeners that she is, quote, mentally ill, psychotic, and jealous of his sick, ugly daughters. I still think it's true. And here's what he said, quote, in my day, that's a mental illness. They're put in a mental hospital. They're given medication. They're put in a straitjacket. They're put in a locked ward and they're guarded around the clock from hurting themselves or others. Close quote. Savage said, he went on, in this demented, sick Western world of ours, this is now considered a lifestyle choice. He also called Jenner a symbol of, quote, the death of America and the nation's unraveling. I'm, I 100% think that that's true. I'm not ashamed of what I said. I stick by it. Does anyone disagree with me? And here's what else they're saying I said that's wrong. Quote, as Islam is rising, America is dying, Savage continued. As Christianity is being crushed around the world, what is rising? Islam. Why is it rising? 
It's not because the people who are joining Islam necessarily want to cut our, other people's heads off. It's because they're vomiting from the putrid garbage being spewed down their throats from the vermin of Hollywood, close quote. That's a reasonable statement. I wish I could say it again today. I mean, I, I don't know how I had the mental clarity yesterday to say that. So I had to quote myself from yesterday. <laughs> from yesterday in order to say it today. I agree with, I agree with those statements. And to, to be focused on a psycho like this, a narcissistic maniac like that, while the world is burning is unbelievable to me. It's about as real as Howard Stern's wig. A 65-year-old Jewish man wears a wig like that and gets away with it and makes a fortune? Yeah, only in America. And what does it show? He mocks people who are handicapped. That's considered entertainment in America today. So... That's where we are today. It's all a hustle. And as I pointed out in the last hour, John Boehner is no different than Alexander Hamilton, one of our revered founding fathers, uh, in, in doing deals against the best interests of the people. I explained the Whiskey Rebellion to you in the last hour. Now, many of you are decent people, but you're free of all knowledge, so you don't know what's going on around you. I don't say you're bad. Many of you are very decent people, but you're free of all knowledge, so you think that what I say is uh, revolting or shocking. It's because you don't understand what's going on in the real world. So I'm going to go to open mic to mic today. I'm going to do what's called unprotected talk because I think that you can shape the course of America's destiny in that your mind is as good as anyone else's mind. By the way, that's true. Your mind is not as good as uh, John Boehner or, or, or Mitch McConnell, the two sellouts. Let's take some wax at it. WMAC Radio, line four. Go ahead, please. Line four, what's on your mind? Yes, Dr. Savage, you seem like you're a very learned man, and but that's only on secular material, not too much on spiritual. Um, I wonder, have you ever read the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well, getting what I call, I call about as far as, I know your parents are from Russia, and you are an immigrant from that, and that's where they get to Stalin and Gorbachev and Putin. And you sound about like that when you do all that screaming and yelling. Uh, sound almost like Mark Levin. That's all he does on his program. And I tell you what, you do. All right, so you, you don't like me. What else is new? Well, you talk about the president as if he's some kind of a, a dog or whatever. But I, No, I never called him a dog. I said he's a very clever devil. It's well, different than a dog. Is, See, you're, you're a black man, so you think that because he's black, you've got to support him. That's your problem. Well, if Jesus Christ is a black man. Well, why is it that black people have to support a man who is so evil? Why? Why can't you stand up for your own self and say, he may be black, but he's really not a patriot. He may be black, but he's selling us down the river. He may be black, but he's doing a deal with China right now that even the unions oppose. How do you explain that, that even the Democrat socialist unions are fighting your leader to stop this deal, the secret deal with China? How can you justify that? Well, is Jesus Christ a white man or a black man? Now, do you ever You're not answering my question. Don't play preacher with me, preacher. Well, why, don't you, why don't you answer my question? If your man, Obama, is such a great man, why is it that the left-wing unions are opposing him on his secret deal with China? Ask yourself that question. Well, simply, I know the answer. Because, like I said, the Republicans are for it. Because, like I said, they are always for uh, capitalism. That's for it. And I'm not against capitalism, by the way. And I'm sure. Well, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, the Republicans are for it because they're for big business. We agree on that. So why is it that the unions oppose it? Because you get these big businesses, the big businesses, just like how you all are conservative, you all like to make all the money, but you don't want to pay out any money. As for I don't want to pay out any money. I pay most of the taxes in the country. It's people like me who support people like you. No, you don't support me because, like I said, I'm a person who work on my own. But like, Well, I good. I'm glad. So you're supporting the people who don't work. How can you like that? Well, like I said, in America, no one want to pay taxes, Democrat, not Republican, but we got to pay taxes. For but you still haven't answered the question. Why is it that even the unions oppose your guy, Obama, on his secretive deal with China? And moreover, my friend, since you're such a just man as you apparently think you are, why is it that this man is the sneakiest president in American history who hides a deal with China and won't let anyone see it? What's that about? Well, like I said, the thing about China, everything is made from China. And China, they make all the money. But yet still, they send over here to other dog food that is poisoned, the tiles, as far as... Uh, well, you're, the not, you're, not make, you're not answering me, though. What I'm trying to do is get you to think the way I try to get that religious Jewish caller to think. You don't have to support Obama just because you're an African-American. Do you understand you have the capacity to say he's wrong on something? Has he ever done anything that you disagree with? I disagree with, uh, as far as him, as far as there are several things I may disagree with. I'm not saying I agree with everything, but as far as the leader, I'm, I already uh, support a Democrat than a Republican. Like I said, I read it. But you're not answering me. What has Obama done that you find offensive? 
Well, as far as the um, uh, the, the the Patriot Act, as far as continuing to allow that to go on, because all right, you know, there are spying on Americans. We agree on that. But if labor unions are pressing the Democrats to reject Obama's lobbying on the trade bill, doesn't that tell you that even they oppose this man on that issue? Well, it's simply called, like I mentioned earlier, due to the fact that these big Republicans, they who own most of the money, they want no, well, to... Well, hold on. My friend, I said the Democrats are opposing Obama's trade bill. I didn't say Republicans. The Republicans are supporting Obama. It's the Democrats who are opposing Obama. The reason for that, because, like I said... They are wanting the money, and by them wanting the money, then... But you're assuming only Republicans want to deal with China. I'm trying to tell you that skeptical Democrats are also opposing him on this. Don't you get it? I'm trying to tell you because the labels, labels as far as you know, they are for the people. And for the people, that means that the poor, the average person, that's what the Democrats... Oh, so which side are you on? You're for the secret trade deal with China? No, I'm not for it. I'm, like I said, I'm not, I'm not wrong with uh, trading with China because I think. Well, well, no, hold, sir. Let's try to have a discussion here. So you agree with me that Obama's wrong on this secret trade deal with China? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying that. See, well, that's your problem. You're stuck in a prejudicial view of him, which is because you are of the same race, he can do no wrong. Don't you understand how limited your thinking is? I'm saying due to the fact that. With the trade. No, no, I'm saying due to the fact that you're stuck into a racial reality, you can't even accept that you disagree with him on anything. I told you I disagree with some of the things. Like I said, the Patriot, I disagree with him on that as far as politics. Right. Well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Unfortunately, in America today, people are locked into their racial politics, their sexual politics their gender politics, and they can't understand that it may be harmful for the nation as a whole. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. And if I can have you occasionally think outside, let us say, the box that you put yourself in, it might be a healthier nation. Well, I'm saying, I'm, saying, I'm saying that. I see why you were banned. Well, all right, I can see you called up, you don't like me, you accused me of being Stalin and Russian and this and that, but you didn't really actually listen to me. And, and now you actually agree with me on the secret deal that Obama's passing. So who's the Stalin here, you or me? I'm saying now, as far as I see why you were banned over there in England, due to the fact that, well, you tell the truth occasionally, but then an old bro uh, a clock that's no good, if it got hands on it, tell the truth two times a day, whether or not it's running. Yeah, 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 yeah. So who do you know who tells the truth a hundred times a day? Well, I, the Bible, as far as with it, and then, by the way... The so your, your boss, Obama, tells the truth a hundred percent of the time? was not written by God. The Bible was on. No, I asked you, who tells the truth 100% of the time? Your boss, Obama? He's, he's the new Messiah? And getting back to the Bible, I said, the Bible. No, I'm getting back to your boss, Obama. Does he tell the truth 100% of the time? Do you tell the truth 100% of the time? Well, no, wait, excuse me, sir. You're coming on this show. You're attacking me, calling me Stalin because you disagree with me. You're stuck in your racial biases. You support the president because he's black and you're black. And you're telling me that although you disagree with him, he's still better than me because he tells the truth 100% of the time is what you're implying. No, I'm just asking you, do you tell the truth 100% of the time? Yeah, no, I'm not going to be put on the spot, my friend. You're the one on the spot. You're the one calling my show. I'm not calling your show. Well, now I'm trying to tell you now, as far as if you can answer that question, do you tell the truth 100% of the time? You're not answering my question. You won't answer why you support Obama no matter what he does. The man is trying to push the most secret trade deal in history. How can you support a thing like that? Due to the fact that we do need trade in America. But oh, so you're for a secret deal. You have no idea what's in it, but you like it because Obama's for it, right? It's The text of this trade deal, my friend, is still hidden in the basement of the Capitol. Is that the country you want to live in? Now, if you really look at to the situation, what he is... No, 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 you look at the situation. Don't impose your, your ignorance on me. The text of this deal is still hidden in the Capitol basement. No president in history has tried to get away with a sneaky thing like this. Why would you support that? What is he hiding in that bill that he won't let anyone examine it? Well, it's about like how you say in there as far as uh, Obamacare when he was first come out there. You got to read the bill. I mean, you got to pass it before I actually know what's in it because due to the fact that there is a loss of hidden agendas as far as in uh, in a bill and do the fact so in other words you agree there's a hidden agenda in the trade deal with China is that what you're saying well he need to get his for uh, China. oh in other words so you're giving him that power of being a sneak because he knows better than everybody what's good for America is that what you're implying he's so smart and so good and has the interests of America at heart and only he knows what America needs so he can get away with anything because he knows that and he's the Messiah don't you understand what you're saying my good friend don't you understand how you sound on this national show? 
And you are exactly the epitome of what I said at the beginning. You're a decent person, but you're free of all knowledge. And I will free you now for yourself. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. All right, welcome back. I don't know if I can hear that now. My mood has shifted. And I'm in another place right now. And I'm going to go somewhere you don't expect. I'm going to talk about evolution or creation in a minute. I'm going to talk about the craftiness of a healer and how hunters actually work in the third world and how they capture their prey through the most amazing techniques you could ever imagine. Lost to mankind. And I'm going to read it from a book called Secrets of Fijian Medicine by me, published in 1982 by the United Nations. You don't know about that. I know that makes me evil, I guess. It was the first book ever, ever published that I understand. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a pioneer in a, in a field of science called ethnobotany something that is lost on the average person who can scoff at it, not understanding it. But in all the years I spent sacrificing myself and my family for my, for my uh, faith in the powers of healing as found in uh, the third world healing uh, arts, particularly in medicinal plants, which account for many of our medicines today, uh, it forced me to think and live amongst people that you wouldn't expect because you, you, you're typecasting me as some evil white Republican conservative as though that's evil unto itself. It's fine. People do that. You have lovers, haters, and people who understand you. But if you look at this book, which you can't buy, by the way, it's a limited edition. And frankly, it was stolen. The rights were stolen from me by a bookstore in Fiji. I don't even care. I, I documented for years all of the healing plants of Fiji. And I did so for the future generations of the Fijian Islanders, who, by the way, are Melanesian or black people, just in case you don't know that. And I lived in these villages as the only white man for many, 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 many nights. And no one saw my race. They only saw my soul. We'd sit at night and drink kava kava, which is an interesting beverage. And we do the ceremony. I learned the ceremony. and We drink the kava kava with the ceremony. And at night, they would look at me in these straw huts and they would say to each other do you think he's fijian and they would say yes he's fijian meaning i became one of them and that ritual was necessary in order for me to be accepted by the men of the village who would then let me talk to the women of the village who were the folk healers with their remedies and i recorded these dutifully this is i was telling about my plant collections the other day which are housed at the bishop museum in honolulu uh, the harvard botanical museum the kew gardens in london I believe in Moscow, and I believe there's a botanical museum in Germany that has the collections. But I found my own collection. I want to get back to the people and living amongst the Melanesian people of Fiji and what I discovered in living in these villages and what it has to do with my, my views of the world right now. I mean, whether I'm talking about Bruce Jenner's genitals or Howard Stern's wig or Barack Obama's failures, they all have something in common. It's all an American hustle. It's all an American hustle. So I live with people who have lived for millennia, 40,000 years on an island, and without any technology. They know things that the most advanced technology could never understand. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. I've been on that horse. I've been on the horse. Many of you typecast me, but you don't even know who you're listening to. So I'm about to tell you a story that you've never heard. I'm going to take you on a journey you've never been on. It's a personal journey. I'm going to take you back to 1969. When this man, this son of a Russian immigrant in America, wound up on a riverbed in Fiji where uh, I went to collect plants. I'd never been there. 1969 now, the country was still a colonial nation. It was before independence from Britain. That's how far back it goes. And the Fijian people were ferocious warriors who had still practiced cannibalism as late as the 1930s, according to missionaries who had been, been there, and had watched them uh, do something that I, that I don't even want to repeat on the show. Ferocious people who had been Christianized. And here I was on the Windina River looking for plant remedies to bring back to laboratories to find medicines. And I wind up in this river, the Windina River, with my friend Dominico's 
Korevenbao. I think he's probably still, I don't know. I have lost touch with all of these people. And the whole object was to work with these people, listen to the women, tell me their folk remedies so I could collect the plants, bring them back, have them sent to laboratories and look for what's in the bark and what's in the leaves, you know, for various illnesses. So here I am on this river, this white boy, all black men, 30, 40 men on the river crossing. The Land Rover came to a dead end. They couldn't cross the river. And remember, I come from New York where there are many races. And the last experience I had had with as many people from another race was when I taught in an all-black school uh, in, 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 uh, in South Jamaica, where I did quite well indeed, by the way. Why? Because I have a way with people. People, I, will f- I found out that people, at least then, will relate to you as who you are rather than who they think you are after a very short period of time. So the rest is history. They accepted me. I accepted them. I got through the stereotypes. They got through their stereotypes. And I went about my business of going to village to village to village to try and find some plants. And then I, after many years of doing this, wrote a little book called Secrets of Fijian Medicine, which, as I say, is no longer in It's probably the most important book I've ever written. And I collected these plants and documented the plants and recorded the remedies for the future children of Fiji so they wouldn't lose their own, their own uh, a record of their own uh, history in this regard. Remember, I want you to think about this. Think about islanders who've lived in these remote places for millennia. 40,000 years, maybe more. No technology till the European explorers or exploiters arrived. And they could create a whole civilization, music, uh, the ability to uh, live off the land in ways that we survivalists here in America could never even comprehend. I love to watch the show Naked and Afraid on Nat, Nat Geo. And you see people trying to live on their, on, on their wits in these strange places. And I think about the culture, the physical culture of these islanders and what they developed. That in, in, in addition to knowing how to hunt and fish and which plants to eat and not to eat, they had a whole medical world medicine in the jungles in the sea creatures there was medicine they knew what to take for pain for childbirth for cough see they suffered the same illnesses that we do let's not glorify the primitive individual and think that they didn't suffer illnesses they did very much so so they had remedies for it and so it was worth looking into for me and so i recorded the the local name and the common plant name and the latin name whether it's this or that and we found out what family they were in and uh, brought him back and all of that. So I find myself on this river. And then coming back to California, I thought about a lot of it. And uh, I was thinking about evolution, creation, where man is. And uh, people who denigrate the evolutionary theory because they're religious. And uh, they don't understand that there is science that does not conflict with God's word. But in order to live in their doxies of God's word only they reject all of science. And so, in other words, they live like, like ignoramuses. They, they reject not only science per se, but the specifics of, specifics of science, which would uh, prove to us that there has been a long time on Earth, not just 5,000 years since the Bible was written. Uh, that would be carbon dating. You say, well, carbon dating, they'll say it's a trick of those who don't like God. You know, that kind of ignorance is very hard to deal with. It's the same ignorance that's coming out of Obama's mouth or Al Gore's mouth or the global warmest establishment that denies that we're in a global cooling phase, even though science denies it. They'll tell you all scientists agree with it. That's called propaganda. So let's go back to that period in the 60s when I was just there. And I'll talk about the hunter for a minute and i wrote this in this little book it's a paragraph so indulge me for a minute california fairfax the craftiness of a healer i was reading f bruce lamb's account of manuel cordova the peruvian curandero who attributes his powers to his time as a captive among the amawaka indians in his description of the hunt with these indians cordova describes the tactics employed to trap the all suspicious forest creatures by imitating the call of a baby monkey fallen to the ground one hunter stopped a band of monkeys in the treetops long enough to shoot two. Another hunting Indian describes his method of trapping partridges. A small ground-sleeping tinamu sent out his sad call, and he was answered by another. You know why their evening call is so sad? They don't like to sleep alone, and at sunset, each one wanders around aimlessly calling and calling and calling until an answer comes back from somewhere. Well, I answered the call and found that it was between the two birds. One bird was nearby and soon had my arrow in his body. 
The other bird, for some reason, came slowly. Finally, but very cautiously, turning back and forth, he came within range and had my arrow in his side. And then I wrote the following. The hunter finds the softer, the softest region of his game, and by employing many tricks, he penetrates. Is this deception? What do such tactics teach about man's relations with his own kind? Must we also seek the softness of our fellow creatures to penetrate? Do those of us who are most sensitive make the best hunters once we decide to stop turning the other cheek? Can there be scruples when survival is at stake? Certainly the hunting Indians who imitate the call of fallen baby monkeys don't consider this question, or do they? Should they starve instead? Should we starve instead of using whatever means are at our disposal to beg our game? Aha, the question becomes difficult right now. You say, of course we must use our intelligence to survive, but there are reasonable limits which civilized people do not cross. Well, I ask you this, can you define these limits? The, relatively, the, relativity, the relativity of scruples, the relativity of scruples renders such questions meaningless. Hunt with your best skills or fail to eat, I wrote. And that's what I was still trying to decide how to go through life. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do you understand where I'm coming from, why I'm telling you this story? Now I'll jump to the next thing I wrote on page 29 of this long lost book that I wrote called Evolution or Creation. And it comes to me from a man long dead, an old friend of mine. He was an entomologist named Irving. I love this guy. He was a crazy man. He was a 350 pound entomologist who talked to himself and kept huge journals. One of the crazy people of the earth who I, I've always been attracted to. I love crazy people who are actually rational. And here's what he wrote me, because I asked him about evolution, what he thought about it, because he spent his entire life studying insects, bugs. It's all he did was stare at bugs. He worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and he spent all of his time in a laboratory staring at bugs and recording bugs. And he understood history, uh, evolution through that, or let's say the, the animal world uh, from the point of view of the insects. So here's what he wrote. He says, Dear Michael, recorded history has of times been compared to a postage stamp placed on top of the pyramid of Cheops. The pyramid, the pyramid is the unrecorded history. I feel a similarity to evolution as we define it. That is 99 and 44, 100% of evolution occurred from the molecule that divided in the hot spring about a billion years ago, probably less, to a cell as we know it. Sad as it may sound, no pun intended, the distance in development from amoeba to the beauty of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony Chorus is surprisingly short, yet fools studying for their PhD are measuring the temperature of mitochondria. The individual cell has specializations that would put a large organism to shame, doing the same thing in so small an area. Lamarck, a genius in his writings on evolution, said things get larger. Note that he didn't say things get more complicated, but larger. If the religionists are going to cite God's will, how about the glory of the pseudopodia or an amoeba engulfing a bacterium? How about a bacterium per se? Specialization purpose, what have you, can be found even in a complex protein, hail the glory of the helix. Man evolved consciousness, reason, a soul, but they are continuations of the inanimate pebble, and even earlier, back to the hydrogen atom, and even further to energy and time. Yet we can be rational and spiritual and even religious without being ashamed of our origins. The religionists need good sex and a dose of souls. <laughs> <laughs> he was a great guy. The religionists need good sex and a dose of salts. They fail to see that continuity does not mean we are as primitive as our origins. Thomas Aquinas showed that strict Christian theology can exist alongside of the ancient Greek philosophy and art. Shades of coexistence. The fools who print these tracts fear new ideas, not realizing the present cannot exist without the past and the future to support it. Michael, I tried to answer your questions. Glad to hear from you. Let us continue together to great heights. Regarding, regards Irving, Happy New Year. And I said this interesting letter was written by my entomologist friend Irving Kaiser in response to my having mailed him a little pamphlet written by a Bible group denigrating the evolution theory that was entitled Darwin's Fatal Beasting. And this writing is recorded in his little book, Secrets of Fijia Medicine, which is no longer available written by yours truly, Michael Savage, your favorite talk show host, and I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. What? 
All right, so let me back up a bit. Listen to me. Many of you have followed my show for years, some for 21 years, some for 21 minutes, some for 21 days. And if you had just tuned in at uh, 30 minutes after that, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. You'd say, I don't even understand what he's saying. I can't follow it. What is he doing? What's he talking about? The craftiness of a healer, the evolution of creation thing. Where this come from? I don't think you understand what I'm doing right now on radio. I am evolving for you right in front of your eyes because I have decided to incorporate the total global savage, Michael, into the show. It's always been there, but I don't like being stereotyped by anybody. I don't like being trapped in a paradigm, my own paradigm. I don't like being typecast. I don't like being stereotyped. I don't like being imprisoned. And I feel that it's important as the world changes, that you understand who you're listening to, where I'm coming from. There's a far broader Michael Savage than you may know. Many people who hate my politics hate me because they don't know me. They have no idea who I am or what I've done or where I've been. And they don't care either. They'd rather destroy me than listen to me. But that's to their detriment. So if I make those statements about Bruce Jenner being a freak who belongs in a nut house, you have to understand where I'm coming from. It doesn't mean I have to go along with the flow just because society is degenerating. I, don't have to, I do not have to degenerate with it. Or if I criticize Barack Obama, it's very easy to say he's anti-black. But you don't know anything about me. You don't know anything about me. You don't know I'm the only conservative on radio who defended blacks one year after another on this show. Nor do you care about it. Whether it was Kobe Bryant falsely accused by that white trasher up in the, uh, the mountains. Remember that one? Remember where I stood on that? You don't remember that. You don't have to remember that because your mind is made up. And that's sad. But my mind isn't made up. My mind is open. And in that sense, I'm the most dangerous man on earth, which is a free thinker. And also, by the way, the whole concept of being a free thinker is the most dangerous threat to any social order. It's the most dangerous threat to a power structure. And yet it's the only salvation for society. Because only by thinking freely can man free himself and others. Otherwise, we're just trapped in our own paradigms, becoming parrots of one side or another. And where does that get us? Nowhere. Nowhere. We sound like Nancy Grace on one side or the other. A mindless fool yattering for ratings. And I'm not going to fall into that. Now, I want to go back to some of the callers. WFTL in Florida. Line 9. Go ahead, please. You have anything to say? Say it now. Michael. Line 9. Go ahead. Fire away. I just want to know what the feeling's like. With a 707 horsepower car. All right. Thank you for the call. No, it's okay. It's, it's a decent call, but I don't want to talk about it. It's open mind. I'm not talking about uh, the Dodge. Uh, I, I forget the name of the. I don't even. No, I haven't driven the car in a month. First of all, I don't have the time. Second of all, I've been ill and getting over an illness. And thirdly, talking about the illness I just got over, and I'm still not over it. I got to tell you, it's moving around in my throat now. I think it's actually cleared my mind. I think that the virus that I was infected with is actually, you know, you know what they say, that which doesn't kill us will make us stronger. I think that my immune system is now functioning at such a high level because of the uh, challenge of this weird virus that my mind is clearer. Isn't that strange? But uh, speaking of that, you know, the virus which had affected my throat is now affecting a deep part of my right throat, which had affected me in Fiji. I didn't never told you this, but I, in those years I was collecting in Fiji, I once came down with a sore throat and I had no antibiotics with me, and I was so sick, I was running like 104 fever. The villagers made a, a drink for me out of leaves. They gave me one dose of it, and it cured me. I felt it burn me on the way down. Literally, it was like drinking some plant acid, and I never had a sore, that sore throat went away, and it was so deep, it scared the hell out of me, heck out of me. Uh, I wish I collected those plants. I don't even know what was in that one. That was a great one. And uh, pre-Viagra, int interestingly enough, they even had a remedy for that. Would you believe it? Even these strong, strapping islanders known for their warrior ways had herbal formulas said to bring life back to the deadest member of a man's body. Even they suffered uh, uh, ED. So I don't think it's, you know, it's, it's just a product of Western civilization eating white flour and gluten. <laughs> it just it, it was their issue, too. I remember talking with some of those healers, including a woman... You talk about transgendered? How about a human being who transformed herself in front of my eyes? Her name was Mr. Wilcomb. She was a woman, a black woman, who knew folk remedies. And when she went into her state of mind, she became Mr. Wilcomb. Which I have her on tape. I have her recorded. I have her remedies written down. She went into a trans state. Uh, not a transsexual change, 
but her spirit went into that of another person. She claimed Mr. Wilcombe was a, I think she said he was a European who had visited the village and she picked up his spirit and his uh, mojo or whatever and she became him and she'd read at that time, she'd read stuff to me and go into that state of mind. But many of the others were just local women who were healers with their remedies, who trusted your loyal talk show host, Michael Savage, entrusted me with this knowledge to record for their future generations. I have not been back to those islands in 30 years, nor do I ever think I'll be there ever again. Nor do I think I ever want to be there again. Because after television, all I'm going to see is kids who want to look like rap stars in the villages. And it's something I never want to see, frankly. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. After those first two hours, all I could think of was a Beatles song. And in this hour, with God's will and your listenership, I'm going to go to the callers who uh, got what I was doing, and let's see what they have to say. And then we'll go from there with all the news, views, and reviews that you're used to. If you missed the first two hours, I can't repeat them. I can't summarize them. I can't condense them. I can't give you the uh, carnation milk version of them where you just add water and get the show. Either you heard it or you didn't, and either you got it or you don't. And as I wrote in my journal when I was 18, those who know will always know, and those who don't will never. Savage, circa, well, when I was 18 years of age. I don't think, I don't think most people got what I was doing, but I felt that I, it's not like you're stupid. It's just like you're not used to it. This is not the medium for it. You're not in a graduate school. You're not here for philosophy. You're here for politics. I get it. But that's not what I'm going to do because I feel that that's not who I am. And there are shows that just do politics. God bless you. If you like it better, go listen to them. But I feel that we have to puncture the envelope of our consciousness to see what's beyond our consciousness in order to understand where our consciousness comes from. And once you understand that your consciousness is a product of uh, a lot of brainwashing, you may find out that there's something beyond your consciousness that can enlighten you as to what's really going on even within the world of politics. And I realize that's a double, triple, backward flip, but... When you look at Boehner, the drunk, the sellout, pushing new secret White House powers with the hidden Obama trade deal, you ask yourself, how could anyone get worse than Boehner? How could we live in a country that's this bad, you ask? And I go back again to the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794, when our so-called great founding father, Alexander Hamilton, was the mastermind behind a military response to the insurrection of Americans who didn't want to pay a whiskey tax. After paying the whiskey tax to the British, the American frontiers people loved making whiskey out of the excess corn that they had, and so they didn't pay any taxes on it. They were, they were basically uh, moonshiners. Well, all of a sudden, George Washington, who led this great revolution against, against the British, said, no, no, we want the tax. We want the tax from you. And the colonists said, what are you, crazy? We don't want to pay you taxes. He said, okay, good, you don't want to pay it. So they created an army of 13,000 men, the largest American army ever amassed in one place during the revolution even to quell the uprising of citizens and make sure they pay taxes. <laughs> so how does Boehner and McConnell differ from these guys who did that to your ancestors here in America? Well, I don't let you figure it out. That's all. That's all. Figure it out for yourself. Now let's go to the callers. Line number one, KSFO. Brent, welcome to the program. What's on your mind? Michael, I have a question. I would like you to talk to the listeners about the scientific method. I'd like a lesson on the scientific method. Okay, let me give you a... I'm going to give you... I don't know why I'm hearing myself. You want me to talk about the scientific method, which is the, the whole issue of evidence and proof, correct, and how you get to the, to the truth of what's actually going on? Yes, I think it trans, uh, transcends most of the discussions we have on the radio. I think uh, critical thinking skills and the way that I... Uh, in, in look at propositions on the ballot or anything I look at, I think I, I put it through the scientific method. Good. I'm going to answer you in one paragraph. 
It's on page 29 of my little book from 1974 called Secrets of Your Medicine, where I say science and art, what differentiates the scientist from the artist? Both seek to communicate a special idea or vision. But while the scientist offers proof in the form of experimental or statistical evidence, the artist attempts this proof by sheer control of a medium. The painting, sculpture, musical score, or manuscript becomes the proof in and of itself. By its elegance of execution, it communicates the special idea or vision. Yet the question as to what constitutes adequate proof continues to plague the scientist. Albeit elegant, many scientific proofs fail to convince on intimate analysis. So that didn't really answer your question, did it? No, but the method does. Uh, if, if I was to say that tomatoes cause global warming, how would we run that through the scientific method? Well, I'll give you an example. Let's talk specifically. Real scientists know that we're going through global cooling right now, and they're trying to fudge the data into, by eliminating the data so as not to expose the great fraud that was promulgated first by the United Nations. So you say, well, how do you explain that to the average person who is intelligent, doesn't have the time to study all of this? Which scientists oppose the theory of global warming? How accurate are their analysis? What do they have as proof? I, I boil it down to very simple answers because the people are so overloaded with information with an eight-second attention span. I try to get people to understand one piece of data, which is almost irrefutable, called the Vostok ice core samples. Are you aware of them at all? Yes, I've heard of them. Okay. Go and Google V-O-S-T-O-K, V-O-S-T-O-K, Vostok ice core samples, and you will find that a team of Russian and European scientists drilled down into the Antarctic ice core. I think they drilled 10,000 feet, which would be two miles into the ice core, and they pulled up an ice core sample to look at the record in the ice, frozen in the ice forever, as to what temperature was like a long, long time ago, long before Al Gore came along with his con. And they look back millennia and they find out that there were periods of warming long before man entered the scene. There were periods of global warming and global cooling that occurred long before man industrialized. And so what does that tell us? It tells us that, yeah, there may be an uptick in, in, in temperature, a slight uptick, but it has nothing to do with carbon dioxide. In other words, we keep hearing that carbon dioxide is the new devil that increased CO2 levels are going to kill all of us because it's causing global, global warming. It's a lie. There is no relationship whatsoever, at least directly, between CO2 levels and an increase in temperature. You know that for a fact, right? Right. I think it's the method is what I'm interested in. So if I was to assume that tomatoes caused global warming, both you and I would do, uh, we would form a hypothesis and we would look at our uh, analysis and research and analyze the data and we would take our emotions out of it and we would look at, at the actual data and what it says. Right, but the, the thing to remember is that when you get a guy, a liar like Obama, saying the, inf the, the evidence is in and all scientists who are reputable agree man is destroying the planet through global warming, that unto itself is a pure lie. Just by definition of what he said, he's lying. Because in science, we learn even in the seventh grade that there are no absolutes. That's the most important fundamental understanding of science that I used to teach to seventh graders. I would say, boys and girls, in science there are no absolutes. What does that mean? Is that there's no final proof on anything in science. It's an evolving learning experience. So for you get a, a, a demagogue like Obama or, or Gore or the UN pushing it, they're pushing a political agenda, not, not a scientific agenda. Uh, there, are, there are a few areas of science that affirm Linus Pauling, the great chemist and scientist, said that one of the reasons he went into chemistry is because by studying the elements, he was pretty sure he knew exactly what was because you can prove what an element is. And so that's why people study things to get to the proof of something. But when it comes to social science, there is no proof. It's all invented, which is why the country is melting down morally and ethically because they try to push their lie as a norm and as a reality. Take, take the thing about this transgendered business. They're trying to make that into a norm. There's no norm to that. That is a construct. It's an invention. Why suddenly do men want to become women? Can you explain that to me? When did that suddenly become a norm? When, why is that to be applauded? Where is the heroism in a man more altering his body and his mind to become a woman? Where is the, the heroism in that? I would say as a scientist, we would want to put that through the method, and we would say, is that a, a healthy thing for children? 
And well, we know we know it is, and it confuses children. I pity the children. I wake up every day crying for the children. What they have to put up with these psychotics pushing this lie down their throat. I wouldn't know what to do if I had a five-year-old child right now, sending him to one of these uh, 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 government schools, lying to them, turning people like this into heroes and war heroes into criminals. It's a world of psychosis. It's an upside-down world. So what can I say to you other than I have my views of the world and you have your views of the world and what is truth? Isn't that what we're saying? What is truth? What is absolute truth? Isn't that another question? Yes, I just have to say, Michael, I have two great children. I'm a married man for 13 years. I have to say I have a beautiful daughter and a beautiful son, and I have a happy marriage. I don't, I don't know how you get through a day looking at what they're trying to do to your children here in California. I can't imagine the stresses on a normal, heterosexual, married couple with children in this sick state of ours under Jerry Brown, pushing that psychotic agenda down their throats, whether it's the lie of global warming or the wonders of immigrants or, 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 or whatever you want. They come up with an invention every day. Another, on every day they invent another story. It's going to be the stability between my wife and I and the way that we raise our kids to hopefully guide them through these troubled times. Well, there you go. Mother and father, the greatest threat to the Federalist power, the family. Can I please send you a copy of my great novel, Countdown to Mecca? I'm sure you and your wife will enjoy it. It is now 16 minutes after the hour. WBAP in Dallas. Deborah, you're up on the Savage Nation. Go ahead, please. Hello, Dr. Savage. It's, it's a, a real honor to get to speak with you. You're a very favorite of mine. But I do uh, have conflict with you and your stance on uh, theistic evolution. Uh, Post Watson and Crick, there's just too much information available uh, for theistic evolution or even uh, one species to another to have occurred. It's been proven mathematically impossible as not having enough time, matter, or space for that to take place. So, well, wait, wait, a, wait a minute. Wait. A minute. It's been proven by whom? I just send you. Well. I want to send you a website. I, I no, I'm not, I'm not going to let you put out a website because that's just someone's uh, biases. But you're alleging that my views of evolution are invalid because Darwin is wrong. Isn't that what you're saying? Yes, I think Darwin was... Right, and, and who declared Darwin wrong? Who, which genius preacher said Darwin is wrong and proved that Darwin is wrong? The fact that there's no junk DNA available to do the process. Epigenetics has disproved the fact that there's even junk DNA available for the random selection and the type. I, mean, I, mean, I don't. I don't think you're correct at all. I, I don't know where you're coming up with this idea. I suppose you're a religious person who want to believe that God created all the animals neatly, uh, all at once, and then nothing evolved since then. Isn't that what you're saying? I'm saying that it, aside and apart from the story uh, or the printed history of a particular culture that has started to influence us the way it was meant to influence us. No, but, but you're, you're of the belief system that in a fairy tale, God created every animal, mineral, and plant on earth all at once and put, put that here on the earth. Isn't that what you're alleging? Well, yes. Well, I believe that informationally you're... Well, I noticed what you just said. I believe. Belief is not proof. Belief is not a scientific statement. Belief is you have faith in that view, but it's not accurate. And you, you can have all the faith you want, but it's not an accurate statement because I can prove to you that evolution does exist and it doesn't deny the existence of God. See, they can coexist. This is the problem is that sides don't understand that they can coexist. You don't have to be either or a believer in science and evolution or a believer in God and creation. You can have both at the same time. About the scientific method? I'm sorry, what did you say? Did you just get through talking about the scientific method? Well, what are you getting at? I'm getting at that there are science, there's a scientific mythology, method, methodology, not mythology, that has been applied to the statements that I've made. And they're available. Yeah, but you're just speaking in generalities. You're trying to annihilate some of the greatest minds of, of, in the history of man to conform to your limited view of the creation of the world in seven days by God. I mean, how many people are going to believe that? If you want to believe it, believe it, but don't tell me to believe it because I know it's not true. Unless, now wait a minute, unless, here comes the mind blower, unless while the Bible says God created all in seven days, a day to God could have been a million years, couldn't it? 
Uh, that is the day age theory, and no, I don't. Yes, that's right. So God could have created the world in seven days, but the word day to God could have been a million years or ten million years or a hundred million years. So the seven days could be seven hundred million years to God, who is eternal. So to him, a sense of time is much different than it is to you or I. So that is how you can accord both viewpoints without having to negate the other. But so I'm, I, I, this is what I'm saying. I don't think you have to throw out evolution in order to believe in God, nor do you have to throw out God in order to believe in evolution. Well, I think evolution is more of a mythology than anything that you've mentioned. Well, you can think it all you want. That's your right to think it and to believe it, but it's not true. It somehow violates your faith that God in his heaven created the earth in seven days and put all the little animals there. Every animal on earth was there exactly as they are, whether it be the dinosaur or the poodle. Now you'll tell me there were no dinosaurs next, right? Is that coming next? No, there were lots of dinosaurs. Oh, I was afraid you were going to tell me dinosaurs didn't exist and they were invented by, by uh, Spielberg. Uh, let me give you a little example about evolution. We talked about last week on the show about, let me, let me do when I come back, about the evolution of foxes in just a few years as proven in a Russian laboratory, he was able to change the evolutionary development of the fox in only a few years, which proves that evolution has occurred and can still occur. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. You Republicans are selling you nothing at all. They've stopped selling altogether. They've just sold us out. And then you got the government jesters like Bill Maher, Stephen Colbert, and John Stewart, who work for the government, in my estimation, to gull you into thinking that they're wild, crazy guys. They're really, un you know, not conformist guys, man. They got the check pants, but they're wild, crazy guys. Now, I'm a free thinker. They're not. I'm the most dangerous man in the social order, my type. And we don't really exist. The, they used to call us names such as a renaissance man. Have you heard the word renaissance man used in your lifetime? You don't even know what it is. It sounds like somebody who, uh, well, I can't say it. it's a family show, but a renaissance man or a free thinker. Those terms don't really apply to me. How about just saying you can think? It's a lost art. So therefore, if I've stepped out of your doxies today of what you would have expected of me, I don't apologize for it. I would hope you'd open your mind to the fact that your thinking may be limited, whatever the subject may be. And if you don't wind up agreeing with me, that's good also, at least you thought. Thinking can actually be quite an exercise when you've been trapped in your doxy for so long. Get it? I'll be back for another big half hour right here on The Savage Nation. Be here and be nowhere. Join The Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. I got to say it's true, this EDV-68 virus did a pretty good job of trying. I mean, I'm not out of the woods completely, but my mind is sharper than it was before it. It sure put me, <laughs> put me on edge, I got to tell you. I think it cleaned out some of the uh, atherosclerotic plaque in my, <laughs> in my brain. <laughs> and what I've decided to do from this day forward, as long as I can, is uh, incorporate kind of a lot of my background and my interests all in kind of an all-in-one pill called the Savage Nation. I'm not going to just get trapped in every day the news. I mean, that's interesting, but, you know, you know, Obama openly admits to sparring with Netanyahu, claims Israel is losing credibility. I mean, I could bash the OSHA permit workers to use the restroom of their gender identity. Minneapolis Muslims pine for Sharia law, condemn freedom of speech. Baltimore State Attorney General Marilyn Mosby says she'll seek order to block release of Freddie Gray autopsy report. I guess she studied at the same school of secrecy as Obama. Uh, China, Russia, and a number of Muslim countries want to limit speech on the Internet that they deem offensive or damaging to their interests. And Obama wants to join them in this endeavor. So I could talk about those things. They're kind of interesting, but uh, I don't think I want to. I'd rather talk about talk. I'd rather talk about ideas that are bigger than that. I mean, you know, I'll do those another day. I have some sound I haven't played yet. I mean, I have some music I play, and I'm trying to reach for the sound that I haven't played. Here's a nice piece of sound that's worth playing, which is an Israeli reporter to President uh, Deceiver. 
saying that if you're wrong in Iran, a bomb will hit us first. Listen to clip one. The remarkably sincere observation you made once, you said nothing comes to my desk that is perfectly solvable. And you said any given decision I make, I'll wind up with a 30 to 40 percent chance that it isn't going to work. I'm afraid Israelis cannot afford even 3 to 4 percent chance you're wrong here, Mr. President, because if you are, the bomb will hit Tel Aviv first. See, now that's a woman who's a genius with logic talking to a deceiving liar who has the nerve to say that 30 to 40 percent I'll be wrong. Well, I'll just gamble with Israel's survival. I'll gamble with America's survival. Hey, I'll bring in 150,000 diseased children from Central America. So what if, you know, a certain number of Americans get uh, t paralyzed or die from the illnesses? Hey, if you want to make an omelet, you got to break an egg. You know, hey, that's part of my agenda. What the heck? Michelle and I are going on vacation. Bye now. Have a nice country. So that's your president. To him, everything is a statistical analysis. But the Israelis don't have the luxury of that. 855-407-282. Uh, Lincoln Chafee, he's going to run for office now? Who is he? Who is it? What's a Lincoln Chafee? Sounds like a chafing dish with a picture of Lincoln on it. So there's really not a lot of, uh, of sound that's worth playing other than the uh, same old stuff that we've heard. Here's General Martin Dempsey, whoever he is. I think he's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Stiffs saying that the fight with ISIS will take years. Why should it take years? We have the most powerful military on earth. If we really had the desire to wipe ISIS out, they could have been wiped out in two weeks. So here's Martin Dempsey, chairman of the Joint Chief of Stiffs. Listen in clip number nine. I have a pragmatic assessment of what's achievable and over what yeah, periods yeah, of time yeah, yeah. in a place like Iraq. Anything Probably. I've said about ISIL and about security uh, and stability ISIL. in Iraq, they would ISIL. have heard me describe it in, in terms of multiple years. Mm. And that seems to me to be playing out that way. And therefore, I think this is going to take time. And um, mm -hmm. so I'm not surprised that there's been this back and forth here in the early mm. stages of what will be a long campaign. Can you imagine if we had Martin Dempsey as the chairman of the Joint Chief of Stiffs? when we were trying to defeat Germany and Japan at the same time. This guy wouldn't have made it to lieutenant. He's nothing but a fake politician, a fraud. Why do you think he's lasted so long under Obama, a man who's purged the military? Because he's a yes man, that's all. A, a fight that will take multiple years. Why? Why should it take multiple years? If you really wanted a war, you wouldn't take multiple years. You know how to take him out. It's the way uh, uh, the, uh, Bush took out Saddam Hussein, first command and control, then the Air Force. Well, they have no command and control, and they have no air force, so you don't even have to go through that phase. Then you send in the tanks and infantry and crush them. End of story. That's a two-week campaign. We have planes that are allegedly flying over the enemy's positions for days, if not weeks at a time, and won't fire a rocket because of this attitude. So what do you think? You want my theory? You want my theory, which is not scientifically provable because I don't know what's going on. Why is this group called ISIS able to commit such heinous acts against civilization, raping, murdering, kidnapping, destroying uh, art going back 1,200 years. Why are they able to do this? How can they do this with the world watching them when the United States military is there in the area? Israel is right in the neighborhood. They've done nothing. You've got poor Jordan and poor Egypt trying to launch strikes against them, and that's about it. We do nothing. Why? The answer is because we don't want to do anything. Because they're basically on our side. They're either on our side or they're a sort of factotum army that we're using for some reason or other against some, some of our uh, uh, other enemies and the enemies of uh, uh, the mind of Israel and, and, and Obama, which probably are on the same exact page on this. And my suspicion is that they want ISIS to become big enough to take over all of Syria and to kill, to kill Assad and take over Syria. That, that's my worst fear. Remember who wants that? McCain, the warmonger, wanted Assad taken out. Obama, the warmonger, wants Assad taken out, but he doesn't want to do it directly. They want to do it in the old shadow way, the way the British used to conduct Middle Eastern policy, which is pitting one side against the other, shadow armies against uh, uh, alleged enemies. And what would the end, end game be if ISIS becomes that powerful, if they do control Syria uh, and Iraq? Well, as far as I understand it, ISIS is nothing but Saddam Hussein's original leadership taking over the country again. They're going to dominate the Shia. They are the Sunni minority who were killed by our forces through two Iraq wars, only to resurface now in a more virulent, insane form than they, than they were even under um, 
under, uh, what's his name, Saddam Hussein. And so we will have a new Iraq under a new name called uh, ISIL. It will be larger in territory, this time incorporating Syria. So how does Israel gain by that? Why, if, if my theory is correct, what would Israel gain by having not uh, Assad, who they hate, obviously, but ISIS? I guess they did a calculation, which is that ISIS uh, would have no air force, which may be wrong because they'll capture his air force, and they'd be posing a less of a threat to Israel than does Assad. End of story. I think that's what they're thinking. That could be the war game that they worked out in their little limited minds somewhere in a bagel shop in Tel Aviv. I have no idea who's conducting these, uh, these thinking. Do you think that they're geniuses? Do you assume that people who plan wars are smarter than you are? Do you assume that people who run military systems are smarter than you are? No, I don't think so. They're bureaucrats. They're technicians. But most importantly, they're nothing but politicians. They're the tools of the politicians who run the country. So, again, going back to the bigger picture and thinking out loud, I don't know why they can't knock out ISIS if they really want to. And it seems to me they don't want to. And the reason they don't want to is because they want ISIS to grow and metastasize into something larger to take out Assad. That's my estimation. It's one man's opinion to take down the Syrian government. Do you agree with me? Mike on WWCO in Connecticut. Go ahead, please. You're on the Savage Nation. Yeah, Mike, uh, just at the same time that all this is going around and it seems like they want to allow ISIS to run wild over there and take down the uh, Syrian regime there, at the same time, Qatar wants to run their uh, oil up through Syria, which Assad won't allow them to do because they're allies with Russia. The bingo. So in other words, the, or the, the oil pipeline runs through, through Syria now. You know, Bill Clinton committed a war crime. Never forget what he did to the Serbs in order to steal Kosovo from the Serbs. And the reason the New World Order stole Kosovo from the Serbs was for the identical reason of running an oil pipeline from the Caspian Sea into Europe. Do you know that? Uh, I did not, but now I do. I'm a little young and uh, ignorant. No, I'm just saying I wrote about that in 1999. It was the same exact, uh, same exact war crime as is being committed right now, in, and it's all about oil. Well, I think you're analyzing correctly, and I want to thank you for that. You're a thinker, so you'll love Countdown to Mecca, my new novel, and I thank you for calling, sending that out right up through Father's Day, which is going to be a great, great uh, gift for fathers out there. Uh, I'd like to move on, and we'll continue to move on. KKOH in Reno. Jeff, go ahead, please. You're on the Savage Nation. Thank you, Michael Savage. Um, you were talking earlier about um, the... Uh, now I'm nervous. Well, I, I, I'm sorry you're nervous, but I really got an audience that can hang up on me in 10 seconds, so try to make it happen. You were talking about being uh, stereotyped, and there's some of us out here that are taking those government checks that you're talking about. We're actually putting them to good use and becoming self-sufficient out of them. So I wanted to give you some hope on that front. And well, what, so you're on government assistance and you're not a bad person. Is that what you're saying? Basically. All right. I didn't say that everyone in government assistance is a criminal, but I do know that there are illegal aliens who are selling food stamps. I also know that there are people in this country who don't need food stamps, who are driving new cars, who are using food stamps for luxuries and trading them, by the way, on the open market. You probably see that yourself. Yes, I have. All right. So we, we're talking about the fraud in welfare. We're talking about the fraud in food stamps. And I see it every day of my life with the fraud in these blue, blue stickers for fake disabled people. I almost, I almost blew a fuse the other day as I pulled up to a parking lot uh, right here in the San Francisco area. And there was a perfectly healthy middle-aged white couple, two little pigs going in to eat in their little Italian restaurant. And male pig pulls into the uh, handicap spot and puts his little blue sticker on his uh, thing and gets out of his car, walks to the restaurant. I say, hey, Johnny, where's your cane? And he turned around and looked at me like I was the devil. Well, now, where did he get the right to have a, a handicap sticker and abuse something that was created for the truly uh, needy? Where did that happen? How did they get away with this? Thanks for the call. Oh, yeah, I confront people with the fake disabilities. I do it all the time. Hey, Johnny, where's the limp? Hey, Johnny, where's the chain? Uh, the cane. They don't like it when you do it. Then all of a sudden, they hold their back. You ever see them do that? Suddenly, it's like this. Uh, they walk suddenly with the hand on the back. They got some shyster doctor to write him a note that, uh, you know, they got a disease. And they, they need the spot. I hate it. You don't know what it does to me. Because I had a, a brother who was severely handicapped, and I, I really resent people stealing benefits for the genuine needy or the genuine poor. So don't lump me in with those who are condemning those who are needy and poor. 
because I'm not that guy. It's that simple. This is the Savage Nation. WTNY Radio. Evan, welcome to the program. I can't see the numbers. My eyes are blurry. Line seven, go ahead, please. Dr. Savage, a pleasure to speak with you again. I was curious if uh, you heard this thought about Israel wanting ISIL to take over Syria. If ISIL takes over Syria, that would allow them to gain their military technology, therefore giving Israel a reason to legitimately, preemptively strike against them in the, na- in the name of country defense. No way. Israel could strike Syria right now. It's a weakened nation. It's crippled. Israel could wipe out Syria in, in, in three hours right now. Why don't they do that? If, if, you, if your theory is correct, they, sh- they should take out Syria now, and they're not doing it. They should, but if the ISIL gets in there, Assad gets removed by ISIL, and then they get to destroy ISIL, and they get two birds with one stone. You mean they got rid of Syria and ISIS at once? Yeah. If ISIL kills Assad, eliminating Syria. Israel kills ISIS. Now they can rebuild that country how they want. Well, there you go. It's possible. I know that there's some explanation for Obama not attacking ISIS and using a, a mouthpiece like Dempsey to ta- keep repeating the big lie, it's going to take years. You know, it's a constant lie. Years. What years? We won World War II in three years. What do you mean years? What kind of nonsense is this? I'm active duty Army. It'll only take years if we want it to take years. That's right. How long, does it, how long would it really take if the United States wanted them off the planet? Full force? Probably less than a year. You think it would take a year? Less than. Well, you don't have to take out their, their artillery. They don't have any. You don't have to take out their tanks because they only have the tanks that they captured from the Iraqi army. And, and I, as far as I can tell, they're still in showroom condition because they haven't been used. I'm only giving them that time because it would take a little bit of time to do door-to-door. Well, all right. Now you're talking about door-to-door combat. Very dangerous. Very high cost to our troops, aren't you? I've lost a lot of friends doing that, but the payoff is worth it if you can eliminate the threat permanently. Wow. Well, you're a hero, and it's men like you who make our lives better. I, I admire it. Certain things come down to reality, and it takes men like you to save the world, frankly. So all I can say to you is my hat goes off to you, and I'll send you a gift for Father's Day called Countdown to Mecca. That brings us up to 48 minutes after the hour. I'll be right back. It's the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. You wake up, we have criminals and gangsters running America. Like in the past, that's all. Instead of wearing wigs now, they wear uh, ties. Boehner pushes new secret White House powers. Look at the top of the Drudge Report. There is a picture of John Boehner that says it all. You know, they say one picture is worth a thousand words. This picture of Boehner could have been photo touched by Orson Welles as a uh, movie uh, poster for A Touch of Evil. Boehner's face is the exclusive representation of A Touch of Evil. It says drunk. It says fool. It says lackey. It says clueless. It says traitor all over it. The text of the trade deal with China is still hidden in the basement of the United States Capitol. And the liar-in-chief, the deceiver-in-chief, the Marxist-in-chief, the New World Order stooge-in-chief uh, is trying to push this forward with Republicans, not with the unions. The unions oppose this. The unions know that this deal with China will destroy what's left of our industrial sovereignty. So the headline says on uh, uh, Drudge, Obama trade, global access to citizens' data, what is he hiding this time? Why is this sneak Obama doing this to us? Answer, because that's what he was put in office to do. The sneak was put in office by the banksters and the internationalists for one reason and one reason only, which is to increase the bottom line of their companies and their banks. They have no loyalty. They have no country. They have no nation. They don't even understand. The concept of a nation is a, is a joke to them. The banksters don't have a nation. We're just one market. We're an ATM machine for the banksters. And WikiLeaks has released 17 different documents relating to the so-called secret negotiations of the sneak in chief. It will destroy what's left of our industrial might. Even the unions oppose it. And a touch of evil in the form of Boehner supports it. That's it for the Savage Nation. Thanks for being here.